ARDS, which is Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome. It is a severe form of acute lung injury that is based primarily on the severity of the oxygenation status and the presence of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So pulmonary edema is usually cardiac in nature. Um, and when we look at Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, we are looking at an injury done to the pulmonary, uh, to the lungs itself. So it has an acute onset, uh, the defining criteria, acute onset of severe respiratory dysfunction, usually with 24 to 48 hours of the initial insult. So this is something we usually see in hospitalized patients. Um, they're on the floor, or they've come in with some severe illness, they develop ARDS, and then they end up in the acute care setting or the intensive care unit. Um, it is characterized by a rapid appearance of bilateral alveolar infiltrates on the chest x-ray, and you'll hear them say the term um, that the patient has a whiteout on on their chest x-ray. Um, please be aware, and again, it is in the exclusion of cardiogenic factors. This is a primary lung injury. It is not pulmonary edema from a cardiac factor. Uh, wedge pressures are normal in this patient. Now, I know we haven't talked about uh, cardiac uh, hemodynamics yet, and we will when we get to cardiac, um, but we're going to bring this forward and remember that when we talk to uh, talk about cardiac, uh, that the wedge pressures are normal in these patients. Um, and it does not stand alone. I just didn't wake up in the morning and say, oh dear, I have ARDS. You, um, it is secondary to something else that happens, and it's usually some secondary to something that was bad that happened. I didn't just get a cut on my toe and end up with ARDS. This is secondary to a trauma, sepsis, uh, something bad that happens. And sepsis are the uh, sepsis and trauma are the two main reasons we do see it in the hospital setting. Um, but drowning is also a factor. So if you're working down south um, in Delaware or at a resort somewhere. Uh, drowning is another reason people get ARDS. There's inflammatory damage that's done to the alveolar and capillary walls. Um, in the hospital setting, and for our purposes, sepsis is the most common cause. The hallmark of ARDS, and this is an important concept that you need to understand, is that it's refractory hypoxemia, i.e., if we give them oxygen, it does not improve their oxygenation status. Um, and we're going to talk about the physiology of that in a minute. Um, but refractory hypoxemia, you need to recognize this as a hallmark of ARDS. So I'm going to say it one more time, refractory hypoxemia, i.e., I'm giving you oxygen and or I'm increasing the oxygen level or your FiO2 that I'm giving to you, and I am not getting any response on your blood gas or your pulse ox numbers. So refractory hypoxemia, please remember that. So the pathophysiology of ARDS is that um, there is an initial insult, and then there's a chemical mediator release in the lungs. That's usually leukotrienes, tumor necrosis factor, um, and it is damage, then damage is done to the capillary membrane due to the inflammation caused by the chemical mediator release. Often within 90 minutes of a systemic inflammatory response, um, or within 24 hours of the initial insult, we're going to see damage to the capillary membrane. When I have damage to the capillary membrane, we get capillary leak. So that's how we get the fluid into the lung itself, um, and that's going to impact our uh, diffusion of gases. Uh, then we have protein leak leakage, neutrophils, macrophages, as these are released, our leak gets bigger, therefore we get more fluid in our lungs. When I get all these fluids in my lung tissue, it essentially washes out surfactant, so we get patient with stiff lungs. And if you remember your A&P, surfactant is what assists us in keeping our alveoli inflated, um, and so that these patients then because we inactivate the surfactant in the lungs, they get this stiff lung, and we need to help them keep their alveoli inflated to optimize gas exchange for them. Because of the inactivation of surfactant, that leads to alveolar collapse, which is, we know that is atelectasis, um, and it is a primary thing that nursing care can prevent. Uh, interstitial and alveolar edema, and this is a lot. This is a, a huge amount of interstitial and alveolar edema. Because of the capillary leak called by the caused by the damage to the capillary membranes, 
that we talked about a, a minute ago, um, we get a lot of fluid in our interstitial and in the alveoli. So now I have fluid in the interstitial space. So that is separating my alveolar wall from my capillary wall, which is um, making gas exchange across those two very difficult. And then I'm getting fluid inside the alveoli itself, and that's where the surfactant's getting inactivated. Um, so I have a dual areas of fluid in the lungs here, both of which are impacting the lungs' ability to function. On assessment, these, patient are gonna, these patients are going to have crackles, and they're going to have crackles throughout their lungs. Inspiratory crackles that are going to roll over into the expiratory uh, part of their respiratory cycle, and they're going to have metabolic acidosis. There are acidotic from the primary insult that caused this problem, um, and then this is going to fluid further exacerbate their metabolic acidosis. Um, these patients have a huge mortality and morbidity rate, and the cause of death is due to MODS, and we know MODS as multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, and it's due to hypoxemia, a lack of oxygen in the blood, um, and their mortality rates can be uh, quite significant. So our families need to know that their patients are critically ill, if other family members need to come in and see them, if they need to make arrangements and plans, um, that this is we need to lead the families toward the direction that their patient is critically ill. Etiology of ARDS is it's caused by a direct lung injury. It can be the result of toxic, toxic agents that directly damage lung tissue and therefore disrupt the integrity of the capillary alveolar membrane. So other causes are inhaled gases or smoke inhalation. That would be a direct injury. Pneumonia, direct injury. Oxygen toxicity, which we'll talk about a little bit when we talk about our treatments and intervention for ARDS. Aspirated gastric contents. Think about the pH of stomach fluid, and if we allow our patients to aspirate these uh, gastric contents into their lungs, uh, that very acidotic stomach contents will do direct damage to the lung tissue. And remember, the pH of your stomach is somewhere between 1 and 2, um, not a good compound to have in your lungs. Pulmonary contusions and pulmonary embolisms can also lead us to ARDS, but remember, the primary factor for the, in the hospital setting is sepsis. Um, and shock. So shock caused by hyperperfusion, and here's your sepsis, the most common, and it does have the highest mortality rate. Uh, people with drug overdoses also, these would be, I'm sorry, these would be indirect lung injuries or indirect causes as opposed to direct injury to the lung tissue. These are causes of indirect injury to the lung tissue. So shock or hyperperfusion to the lung tissue itself. Sepsis is the most common and has the highest mortality rate. Drug overdoses, uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC. Pancreatitis. Think about your uh, anatomy and where does the pancreas sit? It sits right under the left lower lobe of the lung. And so as the pancreas is eating itself and releasing digestive juices or even hemorrhaging in hemorrhagic pancreatitis, those juices are right there at the bottom of the left lower lobe. People with pancreatitis are at high risk for uh, left lower lobe pleural effusions, um, but that can also lead to ARDS in these patients. Um, fat emboli, amniotic fluid emboli, multiple transfusions, bypasses machines, and certain medications, amiodarone, opioids, and aspirin. can also cause indirect lung injury, or, but that can lead to ARDS. The patients are going to be in a lot of respiratory distress, and they're going to be using every accessory muscle that they have. Um, because their respiratory rate, then they're in respiratory distress, their respiratory rates will be high initially, um, and so that they're going to be in respiratory alkalosis because their respiratory rate is high as they're struggling to bring more oxygen in, they're going to be blowing off their CO2. And remember that CO2 is the acid component, um, and if my respiratory rate is up, I'm going to blow it off, putting me into initially respiratory respiratory alkal alkalosis. As I tire and become more sick, I'm going to be unable to maintain that respiratory rate. My respiratory rate is going to drop, and then those acids are going to accumulate, and I'm going to then go over the curve to respiratory um, acidosis. Due to the underlying factors, I will also have an underlying metabolic acidosis as well. These patients are cyanotic because, as we talked about, they're refractive, refractive to the administration of oxygen, i.e., I give them oxygen. It cannot cross that interface between the alveoli and the capillary membrane. Um, therefore, it doesn't get to the tissue causing cyanosis. Initially, they're going to have crackles and inspiratory sound, high-pitched, um, and then as the fluid accumulates and they get more fluid in their lungs, then what you're going to be auscultating is ronchi.
And again, a differential are going to be normal pulmonary artery wedge pressures. And again, just keep this thought, carry it forward when we get to cardiac, and we'll re-mention ARDS, and, and that will make a lot more sense for you. Management is to find and treat the underlying cause. We've said that we cannot give these patients oxygen because they're not going to respond to it. We have to get rid of that fluid in there first. We have to get rid of the cause of the problem in our lung. And we need to give them, uh, put them on the ventilators or give them mechanical ventilation. What we need to give them with the mechanical ventilation is positive pressure. If I can put positive pressure in their alveoli, it will keep their alveoli expanded during inhalation and exhalation. It's going to increase the surface area of the alveoli, and it will push across that interface of, um, to the capillaries to encourage and enhance gas exchange across that space. The other thing that the positive pressure will do is going to push the fluid out of the alveoli. So positive pressure via mechanical ventilation is a mainstay management of ARDS and for twofold reasons. It will push the fluid out of the alveoli, and it's going to keep those alveoli expanded, increasing their surface area so that I can get across that interface um, and get more oxygen into the capillaries and distributed to the tissues. The problem is, we said earlier that the lungs in ARDS are stiff. If I'm putting positive pressure into stiff alveoli, I, have, I can set myself up for causing worsening lung damage, and that would be caused barotrauma. Um, if I, the more pressure I put in the alveoli, at some point with that stiff lung, um, I could actually rupture an alveoli or cause more uh, lung damage. So we have to decrease the volumes that we're giving them, but keep that alveoli um, open during inhalation and exhalation. And it's a very balancing game. We tweak our numbers here and there um, to get the best blood gas for our patient. But our first move is with our pressures, our tidal volume and our PEEP, our positive end expiratory pressures. Um, it is not by increasing the oxygen levels to the patient. And that's a very important concept for you to grasp. We want the oxygen at the lowest setting to maintain their, uh, the partial pressure of oxygen in their bloodstream, in arterial blood, greater than 60 millimeters of mercury. And that's low normal for uh, somebody's blood gas. We're going to add positive end expiratory pressure and or continuous positive airway pressure. CPAP is non-invasive. It's not on a mechanical vent. These patients do get really sick, and the majority of them are on mechanical ventilation, so we'll increase their PEEP. We can give them surfactant therapy. Since their surfactant was washed out by that fluid in the alveoli, we can replace it. They've had some luck with that. Uh, steroids are controversial. We do want careful fluid replacement because of the inflammatory process. Remember we said sepsis was the major cause of ARDS. Because of that capillary leak, um, we need to be judicious with our fluids. We can't just flood them with fluids because it's going to leak out of the capillaries and, and we're going to continue to put more fluid in our interstitial spaces in the lungs and throughout their entire body. Inhaled nitrous oxides is used at some facilities. and. Um, that helps uh, maintain the integrity of the alveoli. These patients are very sick, so they have a long road to recovery. We have to be very cognizant of nutritional support and make sure that they're being fed and getting adequate calories. Antibiotics, especially in the setting of sepsis, we need them up early to help prevent ARDS in the first place, um, but to get rid of the cause that we're calling. The patients need to be sedated and paralyzed on the ventilator, and we need to medicate them for pain. Remember, just if we're sedating and paralyzing someone, we're not necessarily addressing their pain. We need to do all three of those things. Possible prone positioning, and they've had some look with this. The studies kind of go back and forth. Um, prone positioning is putting their patient on the stomach. Now, if you imagine somebody that has a small Gantz, an endotracheal tube, multiple IVs, a Foley, an NG tube, or a PEG tube, um, think of the nursing care uh, resource that would be involved in placing this patient on their stomach, positioning, watching all the tubes and wires. They do have specialty beds that do this, especially at respiratory centers. Um, that way the patient's on the bed, and then the whole bed just flips, and it's much easier to manage all the tubes and wires while we turn them. But by putting someone on there in a prone position, it does recruit all the alveoli. So just the way that they're positioned helps keep those alveoli open and keeps the fluid out of those spaces. Biggest one here is correct the underlying cause. 
We do need careful and frequent respiratory assessments on them, vital signs, breath sounds with patients, especially receiving PEEP um, as we increase the positive pressure or the uh, and expiratory pressure on these, we can rupture alveoli. Their lungs are stiff from the direct damage to their lungs. Um, they can rupture and cause pneumothorci. So every time we increase a pressure on a patient's ventilator settings with ARDS, we need to auscultate breath sounds afterwards just to rule out that they have not uh, popped along, as they say, or developed a pneumothorax. Daily weights, because we're very concerned about um, judicious fluid replacement and getting the fluids off of them. Assess kidney function, especially in the setting of hypotension or, seti or sepsis. Remember, kidneys always take a hit, and so we need to keep an eye on those BUN and creatinines and urinary outputs. Monitor for secondary infections. We've got a lot of invasive lines on these patients. They are the sickest of the sick, so we need to make sure that they're not getting developing UTIs, line infections, septicemias, those sorts of things. Careful weaning trials. They're going to uh, wean them low and slow because um, I said, as I said, these are very sick. Monitor hemodynamic status. That's with our SWAN, our central venous pressure lines, our swan gantz lines. Uh, monitor them for pain, fever, and restlessness. We want all of the energy of their body going to rest and recovery um, and getting better as opposed to fighting with us or being scared or anxious um, in the ICU setting. Recovery, uh, if they don't uh, meet that mortality rate, they can recover, but most of them don't recover without some added tax, if you will. Um, they can develop pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary hypertensive, and right-sided heart failure um, from pushing against all that pressure in their lung, and especially in the setting of our elderly or people that were uh, have chronic illnesses with that right-sided heart failure. So they don't usually escape unscathed from ARDS.